in uh, relations between communist countries. China took the line that the source of the crisis in Eastern Europe lay in Moscow's big power chauvinism and conveyed its firm opposition to Soviet military intervention. Moscow itself decided against recourse to armed action and issued a declaration on October 30th asserting the, quote, principles of full equality, respect of territorial integrity, state independence and sovereignty and non-interference in domestic affairs, unquote, governing relations between socialist states. China immediately offered its support through a statement issued on November 1, hailing the Moscow Declaration as of great importance in, quote, correcting errors in mutual relations between socialist states, unquote, and asserting that socialist states were inherently able to better apply the five principles than capitalist countries. Thus, the statement made the point that relations between socialist countries should all the more be based on the five principles of peaceful coexistence. This turned out to be a singularly short-lived position. China soon reversed its position, almost immediately reversed its position on military intervention in the context of developments in Hungary. The Gomulka government in Warsaw had pledged its fealty to the Warsaw Pact. In Budapest, however, the newly installed Naj regime announced its intention of quitting the Warsaw Pact. Mao then decided that Hungary had become a quote-unquote battleground for socialism, unquote, and China urged Moscow to, quote, suppress the counter-revolutionary armed rebellion, unquote, by military force. Uh, the shift in the Chinese position, I mean, almost immediately after November 1, it, China reverted to its traditional position on ties between socialist countries as formulated in the Sino-Soviet Treaty of 1954. Uh, by 1958, Panchil had reached the zenith of its influence, though bo uh, uh, border incidents began to occur uh, within months of the signature of the Tibet Treaty, these early encounters did not involve exchange of fire or loss of lives. However, on 21st October 1959, Chinese troops opened fire on an Indian patrol killing a number of, uh, of Indian troops. This had a powerful impact on Indian public opinion and led to a sharp questioning of Chinese intentions. The Tibetan uprising and the Dalai Lama's flight to India in 1959 also led to serious complications in India-China uh, uh, relations. Now, in contrast to India, China's foreign policy underwent more than one dramatic change, of course, during the Cold War years. Starting as a Soviet ally and an adversary of the United States, it turned against Moscow at the end of the 1950s and embarked on a policy of staunch opposition to both superpowers. It again changed course in the early 1970s when it normalized relations with Washington in order to contain its former Soviet ally. Finally, uh, the latter half of the 1970s witnessed the normalization of Sino-Soviet ties. The Chinese position on the five principles shifted with each of these policy transformations. Ironically, disagreement over peaceful coexistence was one of the underlying factors in the Sino-Soviet split. At the 20th Communist Party Congress in 1956, Soviet Communist Party Congress, Khrushchev sounded a call for peaceful coexistence between the rival blocs. Beijing initially supported the call, but soon reversed its position, mainly because of apprehensions that the principle inhibited active Soviet support for China's efforts to regain control of Taiwan. Scholars have viewed the 1958 Taiwan Strait crisis as Mao's challenge to the Soviet strategy of peaceful coexistence. In 1959, 
China reinforced its rejection of peaceful coexistence by strident calls for world revolution. The following decade witnessed a rapid downward spiral in Sino-Soviet relations, culminating in military confrontation along the disputed border. China denounced the Soviet Union as a social imperialist state. In 1969, border clashes on the Usuri River raised the scepter of war between the former allies. On September 11th, in the wake of the Usuri incidents, Zhou Lai met with Soviet Premier Kosygin at the Beijing airport while the latter was in transit on his way home from Hanoi. During an exchange of views on ways to restore stability in bilateral relations, Zhou stated that though proletarian internationalism was not applicable in the case of ties with Moscow, state-to-state -state relations could be maintained on the basis of the five principles. Jews' initiative, however, did not yield concrete results. The Usuri clashes triggered off a chain of events that eventually led to a Sino-US rapprochement and normalization of relations between the erstwhile enemies. China had originally advanced the five principles of peaceful coexistence as a diplomatic counter to U.S. influence in Asia. With normalization of Sino-U.S. ties, the five principles appeared in a startling new incarnation. The Shanghai Communique of 1972, which established the basis of the new relationship, devoted an entire paragraph listing the principles while refraining from using the label Five Principles of Peaceful Coexistence. Let me quote from this paragraph. The two sides agreed that countries, regardless of their social systems, should conduct their relations on the principles of respect for the sovereign and territorial integrity of all states, non-aggression against other states, non-interference in the internal affairs of other states, equality and mutual benefit, and peaceful coexistence. All the five principles. International disputes should be settled on this basis without resorting to the use of force. The United States and the People's Republic of China are prepared to apply these principles to their mutual relations, unquote. So we have a reiteration of the five principles in the Shanghai Communique. In 1976, India and China agreed to restore diplomatic ties to the ambassadorial level. Relations between the two countries registered slow but steady improvement in the following years, leading to Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi's landmark visit to Beijing in 1988, almost three decades after Premier Zhou Lai's visit to India in 1960. The Rajiv Gandhi visit delinked the border question from other issues and thus established the basis for steady progress in India-China relations. This was reflected in the joint press communique issued at the conclusion of the visit, which for the first time since the 1950s included a substantive reference to the five principles. Panchil no longer arouses either the enthusiastic support or the controversy that attended its birth in the mid-1950s. Its regular reiteration in uh, India-China exchanges may be seen as reflecting a generally stable state of relations between the two countries, despite their well-known uh, differences over the border. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Das Gupta for such a comprehensive overview of the origins and evolution of the Panchil principles through quite unexpected, tortuous processes that we did not know. May I request now Kumar Ketka, editor of Lok Sattah, to make his presentation on Pandit Nehru's politics in the context of Cold War. The title of my paper was supposed to be Pandit Nehru's politics in the context of Cold War. The United States and Britain mainly the Anglo-US powers, their main aim after India's independence was to dismantle Nehruvian structure. 
and that approach of trying to dismantle Nehruvian structure, a lot many anomalies, aberrations and perversions took place in this subcontinent. And actually most of the time, first Pandit Nehru, then Indira Gandhi and then Rajiv Gandhi, and I am not referring to them in a dynastic order, but in the regime sense, their main task has always been, though not often publicly stated or made vocal in that form, is to fight the forces unleashed by Anglo-US access to dismantle Nehruvian structure and in the process destabilize Indian polity, destabilize Indian society. As I uh, told uh, Dr. Mukherjee that I am not a historian, therefore I can take liberty in believing many conspiracy theories and uh, Conspiracy theories are generally looked down upon, but I have somehow some faith in them because some of them have been proved to be true after a few years and then they have been incorporated in history. But at the time when somebody was raising the conspiracy theories, it was always considered as below par. It's not historically proven because many of the conspiracy theories cannot provide concrete evidence. And most of the time concrete evidence is not even available. Because what happens in uh, Langley in United States or what happens in Kremlin for that matter or what happens in the intelligence institutions is not always written down and even if it is written down, not necessarily that uh, despite the information freedom clauses, it is not always published. So much depends on the circumstantial evidence that uh, conspiracy theorists gather. I will just give one simple later day conspiracy theory by circumstantial evidence. For instance, it would be uh, very naive to say that in just matter of uh, nine years, three major leaders of the Indian subcontinent died in most unnatural circumstances. In 1975, Mujibur Rahman and his almost entire family minus Sheikh Hasina were killed, entire family, brutally killed. Lawrence Lifshultz wrote a book called The Murder of Bangladesh immediately after that, about four years later, and he has given in details, in details, the accounts of the CIA, the Nixon Kissinger policy, China and Pakistan, how they indirectly or directly cooperated and directly worked together to kill Mujibur Rahman and his family and bring about another regime of Mr. Rahman, M. Rahman. Incidentally, M. Rahman was also killed in 1981, six years later, after Mujib was killed. But in between, in 1975, after Mujib was killed, Bhutto was removed from power in 1977 and hanged, which is now globally recognized as judicial murder. So it was in 75 that Mujibur Rahman is killed, in 79 Bhutto is killed and in 1984 Indira Gandhi is killed. All three of them relatively young political heads of the states and they died in not only unnatural circumstances, in most suspicious circumstances. Now it would be absurd to, for anybody to say that this was well inevitable Mrs. Gandhi was killed because of uh, Golden Temple, her actions in Golden Temple. Mujib Rahman was killed because between 1970 and 1975 he did not rule properly, there was a lot of corruption. And in 1979 Bhutto was hanged because of the, all the kinds of crimes he had committed during his regime and before, so he had to be hanged. The question is not whether Mujib Rahman was a saint, Bhutto was a saint, but the idea of dismantling Nehruvian structure in the Indian subcontinent, particularly India, was definitely the plan of uh, the imperialist powers or just now as you mentioned, different forms of colonialism or different forms of imperialism. I can also say, unfortunately I would say, that the cold warriors, the new imperialist cold warriors, have actually, in today's circumstances, I find, have succeeded in their games in India. And I find now that the entire Nehruvian structure is endangered 
by the forces which were which were unleashed by United States and England in those days. They had identified three or four spots in India which will become the major points of conflict where they can create their own uh, their hand they can have. One was of course uh, Tibet, then there was of course there is and there was Kashmir and there was Nepal and partly even Sikkim. In 1974 when Mrs. Gandhi's politics helped Sikkim to be integrated with India, perhaps many of, will you, many of you will remember how much you and cry was made by the U.S. representative institutions in India in the press, among the individuals, among the intellectuals, among the scholars and so on. And these institutions were created when Nehru was Prime Minister in India. The so-called cultural freedom related institutions in India were created when Nehru was there. The references to C2 and other political which have been correctly made. And all those institutions and individuals, a whole network of uh, media persons, whole network of institutions, whole network of intellectual analytical frame was created between 1954 and 1959 and that was used to destabilize Nehruvian frame of India. And this can be easily seen if you look around. The kind of papers that used to be presented in various conferences which were organized, various books that were written, essentially the evidence used to come from the American database. And today we see that actually to a certain extent these people winning the post-Cold War anti-Nehru war in India. And that is why we find it is not question of Nehruvian dynasty of Sonia Gandhi or Rahul Gandhi or others, they are against they are, they are against the Nehruvian framework. Family is just one dimension of that Nehruvian framework and not the actual political reflection. And so my, my only thesis is that between 1950 and 1960 particularly, because in 1961 we find uh, the Berlin War coming up. In 1962 we see China and Cuba, India-China War and the Cuban confrontation taking place in the same year. In 1963, John Kennedy is killed and 1964, Pandit Nehru is killed. It just so happens that after so many years, we find that now US and Cuba have been, uh, have re-established their ties. There were people in India, including uh, in the Congress, Moraji Desai himself had said that we should support two China policy. So the imperialist powers had clearly identified the forces inside India, the political forces, political parties, individuals, scholars, intellectuals, institutions, and mainly the media organizations who will help their cause. And they have successfully used them. In 1969 they used it, but even before, 69 became very pronounced, the use of these institutions and individuals became very pronounced in 1969 or post 1969, but it was taking place ever since 1953 or 54. My contention is therefore that if Nehruvian structure today is endangered, it is not because of some internal errors or mistakes or blunders by Pandit Nehru himself or Indira Gandhi, but because they were, they have been threatened by these institutions who consider Nehruvian, Nehru philosophy and Nehruvian worldview as a threat for their kind of expansion, their kind of imperialist or neo-colonial multinational companies interest. I think that point I need not uh, enlarge more, there is a lot I have written, but I will submit the paper later. Basically I entirely endorse what Mr. Dagupta said in the overall frame, that frame is correct, only point I will make at the end is that uh, let us not underestimate even now that threat because their game is not yet complete. Their game is going on and that game perhaps shatter India's interests and India's democratic, secular, liberal polity much more. I think time to be alert, time to be more aware and time to refer to Nehru again has come. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. As, as you will all agree, uh, this was not anticipated, but what a wonderful idea to have uh, a functioning diplomat, a journalist, uh,
to talk about things that a historian is now going to talk about. Hmm? But it, it is it is really uh, been such a learning process because you come from different angles and with greater freedom than often the historian uh, approaches the subject. Now I would uh, invite uh, Dr. Chandrasekhar Das Gupta, sorry, Dr. Amit Das Gupta of the uh, of, uh, a university in Munich to talk on Nehru's invisible advisor. Foreign Secretary Subhimal Dutt. Uh, to introduce Subhimal Dutt is an uh, easy task in Bangladesh and in West Bengal where everybody knows him. In Delhi it's much less. Most people have heard about him but have rather vague uh, ideas about him. And abroad he is a more or less uh, unknown uh, person. So he was born in 1903 in a village, Kanungupara, near Chittagong. And uh, he didn't have that uh, typical ICS background at all. You know that most of the ICS officers came from urban middle class families or from families which had a tradition of administrators. So Shukimalat had a Bodorog background, uh, but the family was rather poor. There, were, well, there was no money, there were no connections uh, to help him into the ICS and help him in his career. So it was his excellent brain and hard work that made him succeed in the ICS examinations and join the service in 1928. Thereafter, for a decade, he was serving in various districts in Bengal. And in 1938, his um, ambition catapulted him to Delhi for the first time, uh, where he was working in the Department for Education, Health and Lands. Uh, this is a crucial moment for him because uh, you know that the foreign policy of British India was in the hands of the political department, which was very much a British affair, also in terms of personnel. But there's a second department, and this is Education, Health and Lands, which is also involved in foreign affairs. That is because this department is responsible for the Indians overseas. So since the 1920s, there are Indian agents abroad in South Africa, in Ceylon, and Malaya, and other places. And these are all Indians. There are not many Britishers in that uh, department. So uh, the in Indian diplomats of the first hour are uh, people who are working in that department, and the department is also playing a key role because of the secretary of the department, uh, Sir Girija Shankar Bajpai, who is one of the most influential civil servants uh, already in the pre-independence period, and certainly India's most um, uh, sophisticated expert in foreign affairs in 1947. And I'm talking about Nehru and Shubhash Chandra Bosch and others as well, comparing him. So Dutt is working in the department for three years and then he is posted to Malaya as Indian agent, first posting abroad, where he is leaving just before the Japanese are in waiting. Thereafter he is back to Bengal, but in 47, Bajpai calls him back to Delhi when the new Ministry of External Affairs is formed. And he has been made number three in the ministry right from the beginning. He is the Commonwealth uh, Secretary. He has a very long term at the headquarters. This is not functioning. Yes, yes, I have realized. Uh, he has a very long term at the headquarters. There's just a two years posting in West Germany and one and a half years in Moscow. Otherwise, for 12 years, he's working in the foreign office on a high rank. So he's very close to Nero in a day-to-day -day contact over such a long period. There's nobody else in that period um, who's working that close with the prime minister. Uh, after retirement, he comes back as Vigilance Commissioner, first in Bengal, then uh, Central Vigilance Commissioner. And then, as I already mentioned, he is uh, posted as High Commissioner to uh, Bangladesh, 72, 74, another crucial posting. So I've turned him the invisible advisor. And uh, uh, if you uh, read Indian history books, you will hardly find his name. And to some extent, this is his own fault because uh, Shubhimal Dutt didn't want to be seen when he was in office. He very much disliked to be a public figure. He had very good contact with journalists, but he insisted that they don't write about him. They should write about politics. And the same line he has pursued in his memoir, published in 77, with Nehru in the Foreign Office, where he explains Indian foreign policy is defending major decisions taken under Nehru, but he's hardly mentioning his own role, which is very untypical for a memoir, which is usually, uh, usually meant to highlight uh, the role of the author, of course, and his influence. So others have taken the hint, and in the memoirs of his contemporaries, he's often not mentioned at all, and uh, once in a while he's getting a very bad hit, uh, sidekick, like from Matai, which he doesn't deserve at all, 
and uh, uh, in Indian history books you will struggle hard uh, to find his name. So uh, fortunately, and I think deliberately, he has left this uh, collection of materials which allows me and hopefully later, uh, uh, later on others uh, to give him back the role he has deserved in the history of Indian foreign policy, not only there. Well, to come to my question here is if there has been a sole architect of Indian foreign policy. So in the popular studies about Indian foreign policy, you will always find that sentence, Nehru was the sole architect of Indian foreign policy. And this is true, of course, to that extent that the prime minister has the last final say with all major decisions. That's at least the theory. I will give you a case where this has not been happening. The fact is that Nehru was an overburdened prime minister from day one. You know that he held many portfolios. He was prime minister, he was foreign minister. Uh, in between, he was defense minister and held other portfolios. He was the Congress leader. He was the leader of a young nation. So Nehru was almost inexhaustible, but Nehru didn't have more than 24 hours per day. So like any other uh, uh, prime minister or head of government, he was relying on advisors, trusted advisors, who would give him the relevant information and filter out the rest. So to explain the procedure a little bit better, I've chosen a Russian saying. The Russians say, Muj Galava, Jena Sheya, that says the husband is the head, the wife is the neck. So married or unmarried, husband or wife, you know what that means. The head is representing and the neck is turning him in the right direction. And this is the role of a good advisor, not to manipulate the prime minister, but let him see certain things and maybe to some extent ignore others. So it makes a difference if you turn Nehru's head left or you turn him right. And uh, there are many advisors around Nehru who are involved in that, who have very different views of world uh, politics. And I want to give you just a few of them. So Nehru, without doubt, is the man in charge, of course. But you know that his most uh, uh, important advisor was Krishna Menon, with strong leftist linkings, uh, uh, likes, um, uh, uh, leanings. And you know that uh, Krishna Menon played a crucial role uh, for India's relations with the United States, the United Kingdom, and was India's face in the United Nations, not always to India's benefit, to put it mildly. Um, from the conservative side in the cabinet, there was the Home Minister, Govind Balapant, who particularly in Indo-Chinese relations played a, a crucial role. When you see the, uh, go through the recent volumes of the selected works, um, you can find uh, many um, documents which were first discussed by uh, the Ministry of External Affairs with Nehru and finally given for final improvement to Pant, who was seen as the final expert and a man with a very realist approach. So here we have another advisor, Krishna Menon, and uh, Pant, of course, are ministers, and in a democratic government, you would expect that the ministers take p uh, part in a decision-making process shaping Indian foreign policy. So uh, these officers have been trained by the British over so many years, and in the top ranks you have uh, G.S. Bajpa, you have K.P.S. Menon, and then uh, Shubhi Maldat. They have a certain mindset which comes from their upbringing, so to say, which I've termed the ICS school in Indian foreign policy. On some points, they agree with the Prime Minister. They fully agree, and that is a certain ambivalence regarding the United Kingdom. So it's well known the story with Nehru, and it's true for the ICS officers as well, because on the one hand, they have been studying in Britain, they have been trained by Britishers, they term brown Englishmen, on the other hand, they have seen independence coming from the 1930s onwards, and they are nationalists. So they have two souls uh, in conflict in the 30s and 40s. And once India becomes independent, they, of course, they are loyal, they are nationalists, and they are patriotic, but they have still these informal contacts with their former colleagues when British and uh, um, Indian delegations are meeting. So there's that ambivalence which is shared with the political leadership. And this, the second point of view is the, again, British belief that the United States are very powerful, but also very immature. This is a democracy which can take turns at any moment. You never know what they are going to do. They might force an alliance with Stalin and uh, change their mind uh, soon thereafter. So this, at these two points, there is broad agreement. 
But there are also points where there is a certain disagreement. You know that the Congress leaders, they were in prison for so many years, they were all very, very well read and they are very, very good in political theories and uh, they had rather little experience in practical politics. So these ICS people, they have been running India, the districts. They are men of day-to-day -day work, of solutions. They are not the big thinkers. Some are as a private fashion, but uh, by their job, they are pragmatists, they are realists. So there's a certain difference here, and there's even more uh, of a difference when we talk about the attitude towards communism. So the British were fearing the independence movement, of course, but they feared even more a communist takeover in India. So all these ICS officers in 1947 are staunch anti-communists, which is changing afterwards with some of them due to their uh, professional experience. And again, here we have a prime minister who has uh, certain sympathies for socialism, and we have the informal foreign minister, Krishna Menon, who has uh, even stronger links uh, with uh, leftist uh, movements. Uh, this all is not um, resulting in conflict because the ICS officers are as loyal as they have been to the British, but you see that once in a while the views are conflicting when they are in the decision-making process. Well, coming to Dutch himself, given the first crucial episode in his term as uh, foreign secretary. So that has been promoted in October uh, 1955 only, and only a few weeks later, Bulganin and Khrushchev uh, come to India, and they offer a great deal. That is, political support, the disputes around Goa and Kashmir, they offer financial aid and they offer arms. All very welcome, but India is paying a price for that, that is, fierce propaganda speeches on Indian soil, anti-Western speeches. So India is transformed in a sort of Cold War theater. And uh, nobody in the Indian government likes that. That's particularly true on the secretary level. There are meetings before the guests arrive. This is an ICS meeting, so to say. And they say, we will block everything we can block. These are the communists. They will try to uh, destroy our political system. We will block what we can do, but it goes up to the highest level. Uh, Nehru is not pleased at all about the performance of these two gentlemen. That has to do with their political um, uh, speeches, but also with their personal performance. You know that Khrushchev is a heavy drinker, and if there's one thing that Nehru didn't like was heavy drinking. So uh, things like that, uh, drunken appearance, and that um, didn't please him. And it goes up to the vice president, whom I've quoted here, Radhakrishnan, who termed them these awful people when they live. And he's saying that to the West German ambassador, who's very much a part of the Cold War on the other side. Um, nevertheless, India has become a Cold War theater against all good intentions. First, the criticism that Pakistan has been, uh, become an ally with the United States now. The Soviet leaders have been in India, so India is getting involved uh, nilly willy. And the big question that comes up for Shubhi Maldat is are we following a moral guideline in foreign affairs or a pragmatic line? So what he's just seen is a very pragmatic affair. You invite people you don't like, you don't like their political system, but they are useful. That is a great admirer of Nehru, like almost everybody who was working closely with Nehru. And uh, for him, it's the politician, but even more the human being he admires. He thinks that Nehru has a moral compass that says him, way to go. And this is also India's strength in those years. India is acting as a mediator in Korea and Indochina. It's always that moral superpower in the world. Uh, and here we have something that is uh, somewhat damaging that image. So the conclusion Dutt of Dutt, who is a mere observer at that, during that visit, is that India has to avoid a one-sided foreign policy. Uh, he um, uh, is afraid that there might be a tilt towards uh, the socialist bloc so he swears that he will be unbiased, he will advise the Prime Minister to see both sides of the coin. And uh, the litmus test comes only a year later with the Soviet intervention in Hungary. And you all know that um, the Indian view of that Soviet intervention was much colored by uh, the Suez crisis and the British-French-Israeli attack on Egypt. And Nehru shares that point of view and uh, says the major crisis is Suez, what is happening in Hungary? we really don't know. Krishna Menon even goes further and uh, sees a Western plot. Says it's just propaganda in the Western media, so to divert attention. And uh, he's getting support, surprisingly, 
by another former ICS officer, KPS Menon, who is ambassador to Moscow and to Budapest, actually, where he hardly ever goes because this is just a, a sideshow. So KPS Menon believes Bulganin, who assures him there are no killings, there, we don't send the tanks into Budapest, there are no deportations, uh, which we all know is not true. But uh, it seems to be the typical effect of a diplomat being posted abroad for a long time, taking over rather the views of the host country. Uh, actually, there is an Indian diplomat on the ground, the, the place to be who is observing, who is moving around in Budapest. But he's a young diplomat, uh, Mohammed Atahur Rahman. And uh, KPS Menon and Krishna Menon both denounce him as a biased, inexperienced, don't believe what he's writing. So, from the hindsight, we know it's most accurate what he's writing. The ministry has even later on published his dispatches because they were so good. They were even better than press reports often. So um, Nehru's influenced by this view. He says, OK, uh, I'm at best doubtful that there's something happening in Hungary. But the main thing is Suez. And then we see there's voting in the United Nations. There are two votes, first and fourth of November, where India abstains. It's a vote against the Soviet intervention. And there's a second vote coming up on 9th of November. So it's a very interesting situation about decision making and uh, the prime minister as the final decision maker. There's a telegram coming in from New York by Krishna Menon, who's writing that uh, there's a vote coming up and it's uh, um, blaming the Soviets for the intervention and it's demanding uh, free elections in Hungary. What should I do? And he himself is suggesting to abstain again because he says we don't know what's right, what's wrong there. So uh, the man who's receiving the telegram is that because um, the, um, Nehru is out of, uh, of Delhi, he's in Calcutta. So that picks up the phone, calls Nehru, and they discuss what to do. And they also agree that uh, India should abstain. They are already in drafting a text, and then the next telegram is given to that. And there Krishna Manor is written, I voted with the Soviet bloc, without authorization, of course. So India is isolating itself in the United Nations. So there's only one country voting with the social bloc, socialist bloc, and this is India. And this, of course, is tarnishing uh, India's image as the moral superpower very, very much. And it's done without authorization, which, of course, is unacceptable to a bureaucrat that somebody is just in such a crucial question is uh, taking such a decision on his own. You know that Nehru backed Krishna Menon uh, against much criticism afterwards. Uh, for what has been done, but there's a second story. We know much less, and that's what's happening inside um, that ministry. There is Shubhi Maldat, who rather quickly believes that the reports from Budapest coming in are proper. And his colleague or superior, the Secretary General, Sir Raghavan Pillai, another ICS officer, shares his point of view. So they are trying to convince Nehru that there is some truth in what is coming in from Budapest. And that's a quite an interesting, it's a week-long struggle. So you see Nehru changing his mind twice or thrice a day. So in the morning they might be coming in a telegram from New York saying that all, all the Western uh, plots. Then there's a discussion with Pillai and that when Nehru says, okay, I think uh, you're right and Krishna Menon is wrong. And there might be a third uh, contact in the afternoon and then again the mind is changing. So this is going on for three weeks, surprisingly. And uh, at the end, to come to a conclusion, there are two ambassadors sent uh, to Budapest um, to see what's really happening on the ground. One is KPS Menon, who is uh, responsible for Hungary, and the second is Jane Kosla, who as a personal uh, representative of Nero, who is ambassador in Czechoslovakia. So they go to Budapest and immediately they confirm that the reports from this junior diplomat, Rahman, are accurate. So this is the turning point where you could say that that and uh, together with Pillai, they have won a battle which they almost had given up because they both considered to quit their job after uh, Krishna Menon's vote in the United Nations says we can't stand for anything like that. And uh, Pillai convinces that to stay on and says whoever will uh, succeed us will be worse than us, will not uh, put the foot down and so to say they win the struggle and uh, there's an interesting story which is uh, has not been told as far as I know that it's all known that uh, the Indian vote in the United Nations but there's a story afterwards in the Hungarian relations that's about India putting massive pressure on Hungary. Now there's a new government, the Qadar government, who wants to be accepted internationally. They approach India for many things. They want to have the legation in Delhi upgraded to a, a proper embassy. They want to have agreement signs. And whenever they do that, that, with Nero's authorization, hands over a list 
says we have a list here 20 political prisoners, writers, artists, uh, whatever. You set these people free, then we can start talking. Before you don't do that, it's over. So this, is, this line is pursued for two full years. It's of course obvious that uh, they should have pursued a similar line with the Soviet Union, but India was, no, uh, was not able to do that, of course. But it's more than a symbolic gesture. It's uh, clearly telling the story that we know what happened and we are back uh, to the right view.